My name is Erin, and I'm talking about some of the research that I've been doing for my capstone. Um, it is very much in progress, so I apologize that not everything is totally done, but this just started this semester. So I'm talking about um, the impact of um, subject headings on how we, you, you can hear me okay? Okay. On how we, um, we search in the catalog and use subject sheet. So a little background. Um, subject headings and bias and prejudice in subject headings have been a major topic of study in the LIS research. Sorry, this is, this is, okay, now you can hear me. All right, <laughs> sorry. Um, it's been a major topic of study since about the 1970s. Um, most of the subject headings that we have that are, you know, the typical ones, they privilege a point of view that is very white, male, Christian, heterosexual, cisgender, the list goes on, which I'm sure many of you have encountered. And the change has happened since the 1970s, but it's been really slow and incomplete. All right, so I'm gonna talk mostly about Library of Congress subject headings, which began in 1898. Um, then 1902 was when ALA called for some more standardization, so that's when the card distribution service happened. I'm sure you're all getting 415 flashbacks. <laughs> Then 1909 to 1914 is when the first print edition came out, which you can see pictured here, the red books. Um, 1943 is when LC first started using cross-referencing, so that would be the C also notes. That didn't happen until 1943. And then in 1984 was when LC published their first um, manual for subject cataloging, so that they were like, hey, people don't know how to use LC. Hey, you should publish a manual for it. <laughs> um, so what changed? Sandy Berman happened. Um, Sandy Berman is writing a ton about, and like is continuing to write a ton about subject headings. In 1971, um, he published Prejudices and Antipathies, um, which you can see the cover pictured on the screen. And then the following year was Revolting Librarians, edited by Celeste West and Elizabeth Katz. And that includes a lot of radical librarianship, especially from the 70s. Um, but also a lot on subject headings. Um, so since then, we've been incorporating a lot of critical theory into how we are looking at subject headings. Um, some of that has been feminist theory, and um, Hope Olson has done a lot of work on that and has talked about various social influences. If you're in radical librarianship, you've probably read pieces by Hope Olson. Um, she continues to write. And then critical race theory has also been important um, in addition to queer theory, which has been in the most recent years. And then in 2005, uh, Stephen Knowlton wrote an article um, called Three Decades Since Prejudice and Antipathies. Um, and he looked at everything that Sandy Berman had brought up in his book, all the subject headings that he found problematic to look at what LC has done with them, whether they have changed those subject headings, um, how they have done it, whether it's been an effective change or not. Um, so I recommend that article, it's left very interesting to look at. Um, so what are the issues today? Um, most subject headings that we still have a lot of work to do about include LGBTQIA subjects, a lot of things to do with gender, um, indigenous knowledges, and Western bias, which encompasses a lot of things. Um, so I put together a study um, which many of you and people that you know have helped out with, so thank you, everyone. Um, the first part was an online survey, so there's a little tiny picture of it on the screen that you can see. This was an online survey that was distributed to SLIS students, um, and it looked at subject headings in two areas. One was the subject heading Indians of North America, which is what is used for indigenous people of North America, and the second topic was a cross-reference. Um, it's sexual identity, C, gender identity. Um, so LC essentially sees sexual identity and gender identity as the same thing. You can't look up something as sexual identity because it's not a subject heading. You have to use gender identity. Um, so the survey looked at how we use this language in our scholarly communication, in everyday conversation, and in the signage in libraries and information centers where we work. And keep in mind at least that this is limited to graduate students, so not everyone has professional experience, but for those who did. Um, the second phase of the study was a series of interviews. 
Um, there were 10 semi-structured interviews that discussed um, people's comfort and discomfort with the subject headings and classification systems that they used. Um, it also looked at their responses to finding bias subject headings in their work and levels of activism in information organization and creating change. Um, so the preliminary results, again, I don't have all the results yet because the data collection just wrapped up, so bear with me. Um, this is a graph that shows the, how people felt um, Indians of North America was as a subject heading. Uh, most people thought it was inappropriate, as you can see. There were some who thought it was appropriate or very appropriate. And then moving through the graphs here, most people are also very unlikely to use this term from the subject heading in scholarly communication. Um, they're interestingly more likely in everyday conversation to use the term Indians of North America. And they're most unlikely to use this term in library signage. Um, just notes from the survey, most people um, prefer to use a tribal name instead of either Native Americans or Indians of North America, that was the, the preferred term. Um, then moving on to sexual identity, um, this part of the study showed three um, actual library records that were books about sexual identity. And the subject headings given were about gender identity. And so the question asked, do these subject headings seem appropriate to you? Um, and here was the breakdown. 27 people said yes, 39 said no, 17 said other, so some people, they said some of the subject headings are okay, some of them are not. Um, but then I asked, do you think that sexual identity and gender identity are the same thing? Most people said no, some people said yes. Um, uh, spoiler alert, they're not the same thing. Um, but this was interesting because it showed kind of a disconnect between how we're assigning and how we're viewing the subject headings that are actually attached to records and how we actually understand terms. Okay, then moving on. We had similar results to the Indians of North America subject heading where people are generally unlikely to use the terms um, gender identity and sexual identity interchangeably in scholarly communication. A little more likely to use them interchangeably in everyday conversation. And they're most unlikely to use these terms interchangeably in library signage. So to sum up what happened with the survey, um, in everyday language, you know, just conversational speech, there's less of a focus on the terms that we feel are appropriate as librarians. In signage, we see the highest use of the appropriate terms, the terms that we see are representative of the groups and concepts that we're talking about. Um, and this, I feel, is related to the authority of the library and the fact that we have local control and we feel that as librarians, we are affecting the way that our patrons are seeing information. And so we know that we're having an effect in the way that terms are perpetuated, so that's why we are most likely to use the correct language in our library science. And finally, as seen in the sexual identity, gender identity section, um, there's a disconnect between how we are applying subject headings and how we understand them to be appropriate or inappropriate. Um, moving on to the interview results. Many people who I interviewed have encountered problems and discomfort when they have encountered subject headings in their searching. They, most of the discomfort has been with LGBTQIA topics, with various Western biases, with gender, and with marginalized communities. And similarly, most people had a desire to, to show some sort of activism to work to change these headings. Um, but no one that I interviewed has actually participated in this activism yet. This was mostly due to a lack of empowerment, a lack of knowledge either about how to be an activist or about the fact that there is bias and prejudice in subject settings. They felt they didn't know enough yet. Um, and also the fact that they were new to the profession. They didn't feel that they were ready to take that step yet. Um, I also looked at some of the search strategies that people used. Um, based on when they encountered prejudice subject headings. 
Um, and what I found was that most people use keyword-based searching. So they don't rely on the subject headings. For some people, it's because they don't fully understand how they work, which is not anything against them, but like due to the fact that it's really confusing. So even though LC published that manual back in the day, there's still a lot that we don't know and we don't understand about subject headings and classification. Um, but some people don't rely on the subject headings because they are so problematic, so they just use keywords. Um, but generally, people did not change the language that they use in everyday conversation, in essays, academic papers, based on what they found as a subject heading. So they were not necessarily perpetuated that way. Then what were the results of being uncomfortable with the subject headings that you found, or the classification system that you encountered? Some people stopped searching altogether. They just quit where they were. Some people changed the topic they were looking at, which is something that you can do if you're working on your own topic. If you're a reference librarian searching for a patron, you don't really have that option. Um, others were not able to find enough sources or appropriate sources to meet their information needs because there was a disconnect between the language that they use and the subject headings that were used in the catalog. Um, some people used other sources than the catalog to find the information they needed including Goodreads and Amazon because those use more natural language. So um, they could use the language they wanted and kind of cross-reference that way. Um, most people noted that they were aware that the subject headings were not necessarily reflective of the material that they described. So for example, you can have a scholarly essay that has a really problematic subject heading that actually takes a radical view or a view that is much more appropriate and it just so happens that the metadata doesn't correspond with the content of the article. Um, and a note from many of the reference librarians that I talked to um, was that they often translated the subject heading to their users. So they might say to the user, you know, this is what the Library of Congress uses, this is what the catalog uses, but here's what it really means. Or they felt the need to apologize for the subject heading that was being used. So there's definitely a role of the librarian as an intermediator and um, a translator, essentially, for the subject headings. So now I wanted to open it up to any questions that anyone have or discussion or feelings about subject headings. Unless there are none. So, um, we were talking a little bit about this earlier, that this is a very timely topic given that the Library of Congress has an actual librarian up there now. They're starting to make some changes in subject headings with like getting rid of alien as a subject um, or a legal alien. And so I wonder if, I know that you've been looking like at this from sort of an internal like slits perspective, but I wonder sort of is if you expect to see some change in this Western, white, male, Christian-centric um, classifications. So I think it's been like slowly happening, but I wonder if you're seeing that this might happen a little more quickly. Um, one of the issues with changing things in LC is that it takes a really long time. Um, when people petition to make a change, LC then opens it up to the community basically for input, and it's usually open for about a year at least, um, which, you know, it, it, to one extent, it's good that we're having this discussion for everyone. To another extent, then we have this problematic language that we've taken so long to start setting up, and then like, you know, it takes forever, five ever, six ever, like a really long time. <laughs> but, we good? Yeah, okay. coming up to that. Yeah, but we're, we're getting there. <laughs> Slowly but surely, so stay active. Post about it on Twitter and talk about it with your friends. Okay, um, <clears throat> so you kind of answered the question in response to her, but uh, my question was, what are some of the solutions or ways to solve the issue of subject heading bias? You mentioned uh, petitioning to um, make a change, which takes a while, but are there any other ways to go about it? Yeah, so libraries are approaching this in sort of different ways. Okay. Um, one thing that libraries 
do is um, local control, so they can tag things using tags either that they make up, or they can apply different subject headings from LC. The problem comes in when it's like, well, I still want to use LC, but like there's nothing appropriate that uses the language that I want to. So you can either not use LCSH, or you can add tags to it. And some people, some libraries even have users apply their own tags. So it's not from like the metadata librarian's point of view, but from all of the users. So it's a rough business. It's when everything is bureaucratic and everything comes down from like the Library of Congress, which is this shining, I don't even know what it is. Um, <laughs> it just, it takes so long. Any other questions? Thank you so much, Eric.